The eroded volcanic peaks of Mount Lidgeberg and Mount Gower are a mesmerising spectacle on Lord Howe Island. No matter where you go on this island, your eyes are drawn to them, taking in not only their majesty, but also their many rapidly changing moods. Storm clouds can sweep across their faces in minutes, showing just how volatile conditions are. Lovers of water sports on Lord Howe know how quickly the weather can change. So when the winds pick up, the kite surfers and windsurfers descend on the lagoon to make the most of the conditions. Zipping along between the white caps for these riders is a real thrill. But the strong winds also represent a real challenge for pilots. Today, the windsock is very much in the horizontal and the pilot flying the Qantas Dash 8 on its run in from Sydney has decided to make a direct touchdown over the lagoon. The wind is gusting strongly, skewing the aircraft in a crab-like position in the final few seconds before the wheels hit the tarmac. To go sailing in these conditions is certainly not for the faint-hearted. We've boarded a 55-foot catamaran, the Cutloose, in Lord Howe's Lagoon for a sailing expedition north. It's five o'clock in the morning, pitch black out here, and yet our skipper has deemed that today is perfect, the conditions are perfect to get out from here in the Lord Howe Lagoon. Yesterday the winds were blowing a gale, 45 knots they were gusting up to, but today down to 12 knots, and now we have to get out from here on the Lord Howe Island Lagoon through the North Passage. Quite dangerous to, to do this. As the Cutloose's deck and diesel sets the sails, owner and skipper Bill Shedd takes the helm. Now Bill sails to the Australian mainland many times every year, but still regards the few minutes navigating the North Passage as one of his biggest sailing challenges. Pretty hairy Bill going through this North Passage. Yeah, it, it can get pretty hairy because uh, you, you've only got a very narrow passage and you've got current against wind and uh, you've just got to you know, do it right. But I've done it a few times. Do it right or you go up with these rocks right here? Yeah, you can go, that's right, all the surf. Well, like I said, the surf break and ride alongside it. You, yeah. you can ride the surf right here. Yes, you, you could, yeah. <laughs> and there are people doing it. How's your, how's your heart rate at this stage going through this passage? Oh, it's all right, yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah. A, you're a hardy old uh, seaman, aren't you? Oh, I've just done it a few times. Yeah, I'll see, Don. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bill, we've got quite some trip ahead of us today. That's why you're leaving First Light, because you want to get right up to that Elizabeth Reef and get there in, in light. Yeah, well, we probably won't get there in light because great, great. we'll probably get there in the dark. We'll have moonlight. All right, so we're coming in under the form boat. Anyway, great day ahead. Yeah, oh, it should be interesting. Clear of the island and firmly on a course dead north, Diesel hoists the main. Lord Howe still remains in our sights behind us for several hours now, slowly diminishing in size as we sail towards the atolls. Well, very special getting out of Lord Howe right on, right on dawn here. Yeah, it is. It's very good. Lord Howe, of course, is your home. Yes, it is. These mesmerising peaks, they always seem to draw you, don't they? Lisburg and Gower there. Yeah, you can see them from 40 to 50 miles away at sea on a clear day. How's the sailing out here in the South Pacific? Oh, well, it's, it's, this is called the variables, this latitude, and uh, it just varies a lot. You know, you can have um, very strong winds and no winds and rough seas and calm seas. And you've got sea mountains out here that make a huge difference to the, the conditions of the sea. They're, they're massive, you know, like they're 4,000 4, metres high and 50, 100 miles long and they come within 200 metres of surface. Well, we're watching the weather change. I mean, you're telling me the wind's getting up much stronger than you thought it was going to. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's just, you never expect anything. You just go with what you've got. And now, you know exactly where those reefs are. We're not going to bump into them. Well, I hope not, no. <laughs> because of quite a few ships have. Yeah, There's a lot of shipwrecks up here. Yeah, they're just littered with wrecks. In a long day of sailing, we find we're not alone out here. We're escorted by numerous seabirds. Later, a family of bottlenose dolphins joins us, swimming between the twin bows. 
This pod is naturally curious and stays with us for several minutes. It's an encounter that I treasure, sharing the vast waters of the South Pacific with one of nature's friendliest and most intelligent creatures. It's a mother and father and a little calf. Two more over here. It's the sort of experience that keeps Bill plying the high seas. So Bill, you're spending a fair bit of your life out at sea these days. Yes, I, I, I do spend a fair bit of time out here. Uh, Diesel and I have sailed this boat about 35,000 miles in the years, in the seven years we've had it. We go to Sydney, we go to um, Port Macquarie, we go to Brisbane, and we, and we go take it fishing as well. Fishing is certainly one of Diesel's passions. He'll set the lure and rod off the back of cut loose at any time of the day, just as long as it's a long way from Middleton Reef, which has been declared a no fishing zone. Diesel, you must have a real passion for this life. Yeah, born in Brisbane, we lived in Morton Bay all our lives, so we've always been um, into sailing and boating. These days, what's the draw for you out here? Oh, have a look at it. <laughs> No high rises, <laughs> no traffic, no traffic at all, no no that boat anywhere. No phones, no internet. No phones, no nothing. <laughs> and no fish today, Diesel. Which means in the salubrious cabin on Cut Loose, Diesel cuts loose with a knife, making some simple sandwiches. As the sun sets and a full moon rises, Bill calculates we still have several hours to reach our first reef, Elizabeth. OK, Bill, we've been sailing 12 hours now and at last Elizabeth Reef. Yep, and we're here at, at Elizabeth Reef at last. Yeah. And we're seeing it much better on the map there. Your chart's telling us uh, we're how close now? Well, we're about, um, oh, here we go. Um, we're one mile away. OK, so that's just a little green boat there. Yeah, that's, our, that's us there. And that's the reef there, Elizabeth Reef, and we've got 30 miles to go to Middleton Reef. Okay, so no way we're stopping here tonight, you want to keep on plugging off? Yeah, we'll just keep going. We'll, we may heave to tonight because it's going to be very difficult to get into Middleton Reef, I think, in the dark. Our plan then is to stay here at Elizabeth Reef tonight and anchor offshore, setting sail again in the early hours to make an entrance into Middleton Reef at dawn. And that indeed is what we do, arrive at Middleton Reef at first light to discover an atoll which has claimed many, many ships. This reef is started with shipwrecks, above water and below. And this will be our mission next time we travel Oz, to explore as many of them as we can. We've sailed north off Lord Howe Island at dawn, heading deep into the South Pacific for an encounter with inquisitive birds and pods of dolphins. At the helm is Bill Shedd, a veteran blue water sailor who steers us first to Elizabeth Reef, then next morning to our final goal, Middleton Reef. It's dawn, 24 hours since we left Lord Howe, and we're closing in fast on a reef that's claimed so many ships. All right, well, late last night, about 10 o'clock, we actually reached the Middleton Reef, way too dangerous then to come ashore, and even now at first light, it's quite dangerous. Ahead is the reef just a few miles off, cannot see a damn thing, except for one wreck, the wreck of that big freighter, the Runic. So it's gonna be quite a dangerous entry here this morning. Absolutely no reef is visible. Any wonder so many ships have ploughed straight into it. Well, Bill, are you excited? I'm always excited. <laughs> You've seen this before I have, and I'm excited. Yeah. Because this is a massive, massive tanker, and it's starting to break up now, heavily rusted, but we're seeing both the Runic here, and then just over the back of that. The Monray here. Yeah. The Monray Frontier. Two plans here today. One, we want to actually go ashore on the uh, on the reef here, so you're going to put us ashore at low tide, so we can walk around these these wrecks. And we're also hoping to find another wreck over here. 
Yeah, no, we just just heard about this wreck, and uh, it's another Japanese longliner with the, it's got tiled decks, and uh, it's pretty we, fancy. We, we've got yeah, we've got the approximate uh, destination to look for it, so that's where we're going now. Our deckhand Diesel remains vigilant as we sail in ever so close to the rusting hull of the big freighter. Apparently, down on the island, people reckon the. Um, Depends on the name of the boat, how it ends up, like Sand Groper ended up on the sand, Rockstar ended up on the rocks. Yeah, and the, runic, the ruin of the Runic. The ruin of the Runic on the wreck. Of course, these, these ships are breaking up. Yeah, they're breaking up. Well, the Monray, which uh, some people say was named after a couple named Monica and Raymond, so they get the Monray. And uh, apparently that ended up in divorce and um, the boat's breaking up too. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking wave signal, the deadly reefs lie just below, with Bill steering a cautious passage in between. Well, in all, there are 32 ships that have been wrecked officially here on the Middleton and Elizabeth Reefs, but it's believed another 60 ships have gone down, the names of which are not known, and today we're going to attempt to find one of them and dive on it. In goes our inflatable as we prepare to run backwards and forwards close to the breakers in search of this new wreck. So Bill, there's a wreck out here you want to take us to? Yes, there is. It's a Japanese longliner. It's, uh, it's a fairly fresh discovery. Okay. You know the name of it? No, it's, it's apparently there's no name known. There's no, it's a total mystery. Okay. The whole boat. All right, so the mystery ship. So you're going to take us out on your little runabout. We're going to yeah. look and look and look for it. Yep. And in the end, this, this whole process of searching for it is going to take about three hours. Yeah. Running around, running around, running around, looking for it. And finally, we actually do find it. You put us in there. Very strong currents today. Yep. Oh, yes, and there's waves breaking all around it as well. You know, it's pretty hairy. All right, well, you're up there, we're down there. The currents certainly are very yeah. strong. I don't think I've ever had to work so hard to, to keep in one place, but uh, certainly this wreck is, uh, is quite intact. The stern particular is just sitting upright there, and, uh, some, uh, and the whole formation of the boat is still well in place. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an amazing discovery, isn't it? When I mean, you think of what would have happened to people who were on it. And nobody knows anything about them. There's no story, there's nobody, no, no one knew when, when it was wrecked or what happened to the crew, as with so many of them. So this, I mean, you can hypothesise and say this ship could have come aground, hit the reef here, sunk. Crew could have, some of them could have survived and come up top and survived for several days until finally they uh, succumbed to uh, starvation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thirst. Exposure, and we're drowned. These days, the mystery longliner is home to a wide range of tropical fish. There's no sign that the ship has been salvaged, with plenty of evidence it sank reasonably recently. The beer bottles are certainly in good shape. With such strong currents, I'm surprised the bottles hadn't shifted or been smashed. What is missing is the original contents. The beer has been replaced by sand. And what about the tile deck? Again, I note, there's no significant layer of sand on them, possibly kept clear by the strong currents. Back on the surface, our inflatable is taking me over to the wreck of the Runic. I've timed our landing for the low tide, but even so, I still need to wade in water that comes well up my legs. Imagine how it was for survivors of this, the Runic shipwreck back in 1961. This meat carrier was on its maiden voyage from Brisbane, travelling to Auckland when it ran higher ground here on the Middleton Reef. Now the survivors would have had to contend with this water. Already it's dead low tide and the water's up to my knees. Much of the hull of the refrigerated freighter still stands tall, 50 years after it slammed into the reef. Survivors tell of how the ship ran off course after heavy cloud blocked sightings of the sun while the Runic was en route to Auckland to collect apples and lamb. It ran up onto the reef in the dead of night around 1am, throwing men from their bunks. Within three days, rescue ships had arrived and transferred most of the passengers and crew. A severe tropical storm then blew the ship's side on and pushed it another 10 metres onto the reef. Efforts to tow it off the reef were abandoned when a cyclone warning was issued. The Runic was abandoned several weeks later and has since been broken down slowly by the elements. Well, how's this? Less than 40 years after the Runic here ran aground, this ship, the Monray Frontier, ran aground in very heavy weather. 
only 200 metres from the Runic. The wreckage of the Runic, like this boiler, lie ever so close to the Monray frontier. A Japanese tuna boat which ran aground in high seas just over 12 years ago. It lays on its side on the reef, taking a constant battering from high seas and strong winds and yet refusing to break apart. Again, white-capped noddies take refuge here, as do thousands of crabs. Six crewmen survived this disaster, winched to safety by an Australian Navy Seahawk helicopter and flown to Lord Howe Island. Today, I clamber all over the Monray frontier, climbing high where crewmen would have once walked in comfort. It's remained in remarkably good condition. And I'm able to climb into the wheelhouse with ease, long stripped of its expensive electronic equipment. Late that day, with the tide coming in fast, I return to the cut loose to begin the long sail back to Lord Howe Island. We're blessed with a classic South Pacific sunset, and more. A full moon is rising, meaning that as we sail south, the wreckage of both the Monray frontier and the Runic are clearly silhouetted. It's a sensational climax to our adventure amongst the shipwrecks of Australia's Middleton Reef.